Hello again, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ and friends from all over the place who listen to this teaching. Uh, I welcome you today to the last session of this series, teaching series entitled Save for Eternity, in which we will try to discuss about the problem of suicide in relation to the eternal security of the believer or the assurance of salvation. And this marks the end of the big chapter of uh, objections against eternal salvation And at the end, we will uh, try to make a conclusion, a short conclusion of the whole series of the uh, of teaching, uh, and we'll uh, we'll end with uh, with that. So let's talk about this uh, about suicide. Many Christians have wondered, probably at least once in their lives, if suicide is an unpardonable unpardonable sin or not. Do believers who commit suicide lose their salvation or go straight to hell? Most people, even believers, answer yes to this question because suicide, it seems that leaves no room for repentance, meaning that a person enters eternity with unconfessed and therefore unforgiven sin. And such a conclusion is based on the assumption that believers' sins are forgiven in time depending on their confession of and that their salvation fluctuates and is not final until they die with all their sins confessed. However, the Bible teaches all sins that all sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven and erased through faith in the atoning death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. One's eternal destiny is sealed and set at the time of justifying faith, meaning that it has already and forever been determined at the time of salvation. Uh, more than this, numerous instances of sudden death may bring Christians into eternity before they have the opportunity to confess and repent, right? Well, we see, all, we see um, this happening uh, many times. As theologian Robert Weinberg puts it, um, what about the heart attack victim who dies while br brutalizing his wife or amid an adulterous liaison? Does his failure to repent in this life forever remove the possibility of forgiveness in the next? And must we not pass from this life with unconfessed and unrepented sin, lest we never find forgiveness and reconciliation with God in the next? And I close the quote. Now, common sense reveals that many, if not most of us, will die with sins we have not asked for forgiveness of, right? Repentance itself, and this is a powerful statement that I'm, I'm saying now, repentance itself does not, doesn't seal us into the heavenly kingdom. But the Holy Spirit is such a seal. So the repentance, repentance is not the one that seals us into the heavenly kingdom of God, but the Holy Spirit in, its, in himself is the seal. And we see that in Ephesians 1 verse 13 and 4 verse 30. And for, for a more in-depth study about future sins and confession of sins, I, re, I I warmly recommend you to read another book written by me as well, entitled The Glory of Righteousness. That, that's where I explain in detail uh, about future sins, about confession of sins. Amen? Now, people's perspective on suicide and salvation is probably also significantly influenced by the mortal sin position found in the Roman Catholic Church, which views suicide as a little sin maintaining a distinction between unpardonable and pardonable sins. What, that, what, what does that mean? The former separate a person from God's grace, meaning the unpardonable separate a, a person or a believer from God's grace, while the latter, equally serious, do not, does not. Uh, mortal sin is considered a severe offense that merits eternal damnation if not repented and forgiven before death. And this creates a system of major or minor offenses within Catholicism. It also creates a framework where living in a state of grace is like, uh, if you want, a moving target for the believer, 
like a daily struggle to stay in God's good graces. And in such a context, complete and total forgiveness is conditional and requires strict repentance. So, the Roman Catholic position affirms that taking your own life deliberately and without remorse incurs eternal damnation. Now, let's see if that's true. Let's go back to my initial question. Is suicide considered a sin in the Bible? The most basic definition of suicide is that a person intends to die or act on the desire to die. And this person pursues a course of action for the express purpose of ending their life. So in this definition, suicide is a sin because it is murder or comes against one of the Ten Commandments, which says, you shall not kill. And we see that in Exodus 20, verse 13, and Deuteronomy 5, verse 17. So, And although we don't instinctively think of murder in this way, unlawfully taking one's own life does not differ morally from taking another's, right? However, we should also keep the following important aspect in mind, that suicide is mentioned only six times in the whole Bible, and in none of these cases is an ex explicit moral evaluation or judgment rendered as to whether it is right or wrong. And these cases are uh, the following. The, case, the first one is the case of Abimelech in Judges, 9 verses 50 to 57. Then we have Samson in Judges 16 verses 28 to 30, although some are not convinced that this is a suicide in the strict sense of the term. And then third, we have King Saul and his armor bearer in 1 Samuel 31 verses 1 to 6, and we see the same uh, story in 2 Samuel 1 verses 1 to 15 and 1 Chronicles 10 uh, verses 1 to 13. And then we have the case of Ahitophel in 2 Samuel uh, 17, verse 23. And then Zimri in 1 Kings 16, verses 18 to 19. And finally, Judas Iscariot in Matthew 27, verse 5. There are also cases of apparent suicide that are morally permissible. For example, the soldier who fights the enemy in a time of war, knowing he most likely will die. Uh, that person is not guilty of committing suicide. As Wimberg puts it, he is not choosing this act as a means to his death, but rather is accepting a foreseen yet unwelcome consequence of what he is doing. In a sense, then, the soldier is engaging in a suicidal act, but is not committing suicide. Now, what about the case of a soldier who falls on a live grenade to save his friend's life? Or when a destitute mother stops eating what little food remains so her child may live? What about a Christian in the 3rd century who was given a choice, either deny Jesus or be thrown to the lions? By refusing to give up on Jesus publicly, the believer chose a course of action he knew would result in his death, even though it was not his conscious intent to die, but that wouldn't be considered suicide because the death he chose was an unintended side effect of his fidelity to Christ, of his faithfulness to Christ. Uh, what about Jesus, the Messiah, who willingly, fully chose to allow himself to be killed? Can he be accused of taking his own life? What do you think? Of course not. Now, is suicide a sin? Yes, in many instances. This is a serious sin that violates God's expressed will concerning the sanctity of life. However, even in this case, there is no evidence in the Bible to conclude that is beyond the reach of the forgiveness obtained for us at the cross of Christ. And I'll say that again. There is no evidence in the Bible to conclude that suicide is beyond the reach of the forgiveness obtained for us at the cross of Christ. In other words, suicide is not an unpardonable sin or one that forfeits someone's eternal salvation. Amen? Family and friends of a believer who has committed suicide should never worry about whether their loved one is still saved. Hallelujah. And this can be a, a real comfort for those people who lost <clears throat> uh, dear ones who were who, who, about who we thought and we knew that they were saved. They were born again. And still they end, ended up 
by committing suicide, we can be sure that those people are with God in heaven and their sin was uh, forgiven. Finally, Romans 8 verses 38 to 39 says, Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, not even death. Let's read this passage. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? So this is what I had to say about suicide in relation to uh, our eternal salvation. Uh, and this concludes the second big chapter about all the objections against eternal salvation. And uh, I would like now to make a conclusion to the whole series, uh, the all 15 sessions uh, of this teaching about eternal salvation. And I'm, I'm going to say this, that the teaching about the eternal security of believers in Christ usually generates two types of responses and places people in two categories, categories based on them, on those responses. The first consists of people who become offended and angry with this teaching. And these, uh, with, all, with no offense, these are, if you are one of those, these are the religious and self-righteous ones who behave like the older son from the parable of the prodigal son not knowing the love of the Father. Although they might be born again as well, <clears throat> their image of God is more of a one who is harsh and judging than a loving Father. And because of that perspective, they treat other fellow believer in, believers in the same way they perceive divinity. And yes, in the Old Testament, the Father may seem a little bit more harsh and judging than the New Testament, uh, but it's also because he revealed himself mostly in writing through the law. Uh, uh, in the New Testament, we see the Father revealing himself in the person of Jesus, who was the, imprint, the exact image of the Father. And we see Jesus as uh, portraying mostly love rather than judgment and harshness. Uh, and no wonder why... God said the only person in the Old Testament that God said uh, about that he was a man after his own heart was David because he was in a, in a position where he could kill his enemy and he didn't. He loved him. So that's our God. That's our Father. And if you don't see him like that, then you will have anger. You will see others uh, in the same way that you see the Father. You see divinity, harsh and judging. So these people, they become harsh critics or pride themselves on the good deeds that they do. They think God loves people and bears with their sins only until they become born again. But after that, they are supposed to be perfectly holy in their actions. Well, that is not possible. Otherwise, God will punish them or cancel their salvation if they indulge too much in sinful behaviors. So these Christians rely more on their good works of holiness to remain saved than on Jesus' righteousness by faith. And if you are one of those people who felt irritated while listening to this series, to this teaching, I would lovingly encourage you to take time to examine yourself and your motivations and see if you are really in the right faith. Please read 1 Corinthians 13 verses 5 to 6 where it talks about the right faith. Examine yourself carefully and make sure that your trust for salvation was indeed placed on Jesus, Christ, on Jesus Christ's sacrifice only and not on your morality or holy deeds so that you would avoid unpleasant eternal surprises when you will stand face to face with, the, with God. <clears throat> Don't try to be more holy than God. It's, a, it's an expression that I use. Uh, many times. Some people think that they are more righteous or holy even than God. But anyway, so I, I hope you listen to this advice and you will you'll, um, uh, get to a point where you, the, the, the Father will reveal His heart and His love for people 
uh, to you uh, to a different in a different level. The second category of people is usually filled with joy, gratefulness, and encouragement to live for God even more. When they find out that maintaining salvation is not dependent on their works, but on God, on God alone, who sustains them and causes them to persevere in faith until the end. They are the ones who will stand in awe of the unique gift of salvation received and maintained by faith alone, independent of their works. They are the ones who cannot brag about their deeds and cannot become proud. Why? Because they know that those deeds are not gaining them anything from what they already received from God freely. They will be more compassionate and graceful with others around them. And I was one of those people who cried for joy for a whole week when the Holy Spirit revealed to me that I was justified forever, even if I still had sinful behaviors in my life. I felt like a great weight I had carried for years as a Christian had been lifted from my shoulders at that moment. And if you experience this too, I rejoice in the Holy Spirit. That means this series, this teaching was, was done for you. And I hope it will bring you the same kind of freedom and joy that I have experienced ever since. And may the Lord bless you and continue to establish you in His righteousness and help you take the message of this series, of this teaching, with love to other believers in Christ as well. Uh, and this is my conclusion to this teaching. And until we hear each other again to uh, another uh, teaching series or another message, I pray that God will grant you increasing revelation in His kingdom, in His truth, in, uh, in His word that will bring life and peace to you here on earth and that will help you enjoy everything that God has prepared for us. Amen? Amen. Amen.